A warm welcome to today's webinar on the future of India and China's economic relations, Com competition, cooperation, or both. Uh, my name is Henrik Jetan Aspengren. I'm a senior analyst and lead of the no um, project for Nordic India relations here at UI. And this is the second uh, webinar that we host on uh, India-China relations. The first one is available on our website and it concerned um, border dispute and border conflict. And since we uh, wanted to follow up uh, on that webinar, we decided to have a discussion and conversation about geoeconomics and the economic relations between India and China. And our Ambition today is that around 12 o'clock today, Stockholm time, we will be a little wiser on the different facets of uh, the economic um, relations between India and China. Um, and we have a great panel to help us out. We have um, uh, Malunchu Chakrabarti from the Observer Research Foundation. And we have um, Per Olsson, researcher at the Swedish Defense research agency here in Stockholm. And we have Amitendo Palit, who is senior research fellow and research lead for trade and economics at ISAS, the National University of Singapore. And uh, we will have a, a possibility for you to, to um, submit your questions uh, in the Q&A function and we will, uh, depending on time, we will uh, reply to all the questions that come in. Um, but please feel free um, to use the Q&A uh, function and uh, um, with your comments or questions. So um, with that, uh, I will start to give the word to you, Amitando, uh, to give us a sort of introduction to the trade relationship and also the new sort of trade architecture, institutional architecture and trade ar architecture that we see emerging in Asia and um, China's and India's approach to it. Thank you so much, Hendrik, and uh, my pleasure to be with you all today. I specifically thank the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and your initiative in uh, getting to a wider audience this subject, uh, which uh, has always been a matter of great interest uh, among not just uh, those who study the China-India relationship as such, but also those who are looking at Asia, the larger question and narrative of Indo-Pacific and the subject of uh, major and emerging powers across the world. Uh, you wanted me to start with a little bit of reflection on the trade relationship between uh, China and India. And I think it is uh, pretty much common knowledge uh, in one respect that uh, China and India's trade uh, is, a, is a highly unbalanced trade in so far as uh, China's imports uh, sorry, uh, China's exports to India being far, far more than India's exports to China and India's import dependency uh, on certain Chinese products has been quite noteworthy. But I think while that part of the story is known, uh, what is also not known is, uh, or less known, is the interesting character of this trade relationship. Uh, to put it to you this way, China definitely is the largest source of India's imports, but uh, that uh, source concentration does not come from uh, exports by China to India of energy products. India has uh, a reliance on imports of crude oil because it is not uh, sufficient as far as uh, domestic production of crude oil is concerned. But surprisingly, China is not one of the countries from where India exports uh, imports crude oil. It does import uh, coal from China though. But uh, China's importance to India as a source of imports is almost uh, broad based across a very wide range of uh, industries and uh, the predominant among these are the manufacturing imports uh, which are essentially in form of raw materials intermediate imports across the wide range of machinery electronic products uh, you know uh, sort of uh, mechanical parts and appliances, parts and components of vehicles, uh, 
India also imports extensive amount of fertilizers and organic uh, chemicals from China. But what is often not taken note of is that uh, the story also has another angle to it in the sense that China is also an important export market for Indian products. Today, we uh, look at a situation where uh, China is uh, the fourth largest export destination for Indian exports overseas. And uh, this is quite striking because this change has happened over the last two to two and a half years and to an extent can be contributed by the developments that have followed uh, after COVID. And for example, Indian exports of marine products to China is of a significant uh, proportion. So are Indian exports of rice, the non-Basmati variety uh, that's uh, been able to uh, achieve a considerable degree of access in the Chinese market. Obviously, the numbers are not comparable insofar as the export characteristic is concerned. But the larger trade relationship is reflective of the fact that Indian industry, and when I say industry, I refer to Indian industry as a consumer, has continued to rely on China for access to a large number of imports, which are either not available in India in sufficient amount or from alternative sources are available at a much higher rate. Insofar as prices are concerned, so this has made China to a very large extent an extremely indispensable source, if I could say. But Henrik, I would also hasten to add at this point in time that uh, China's importance as a sourcing location is not an India-specific phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon, if you look at it that way. So, so let's say, for example, when we look at um, very important industries like pharmaceuticals, and uh, when we look at the supply chains of these items, we do realize that when it comes to production of bulk drugs and active pharmaceutical ingredients, which go into the production of uh, genetic and final drug formulations, uh, China actually has uh, completely uh, dominated the global production and the global supply chains in this regard. Similarly, if you look at uh, other products uh, where China's typical advantage has always been in so far as uh, scale intensive but cheaply carried out production is concerned across a large number of manufacturing items, those are products that have not just directly contributed to final consumption requirements of Indian consumers, but have also to a very large extent met the requirements of Indian producers. For example, telecom equipment uh, production, if you look at it that way, the Chinese sources have been very important in this regard. I alluded to fertilizers earlier, uh, for which uh, India has had a considerable reliance on China. Now, when it comes to certain strategic industries, and this is where the trade relationship probably takes a turn towards a geostrategic and geoeconomic direction. That is, when you look at uh, products like, let's say, for example, uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients in the pharmaceutical industry, when you look at fertilizers, when you look at parts and components that are going into a manufacture of automobiles, or even when you look at a, a product like coal, is ultimately feed into, and finally, let me also add to this solar panels and modules, for which India depends considerably on China as a source. All these industries ultimately uh, get into a profile where they are very significant so far as the country's economic wherewithal is concerned. And let's say, for example, this has uh, become very evident during the COVID-19 crisis that supply of uh, pharmaceutical products is absolutely essential. And here I'm not just alluding to vaccines because vaccines are one part of the healthcare, health services, health response parameters. But there's another site where vaccines need to be backed by availability of sufficient amount of uh, consumable drugs, medical accessories and allied equipment for which uh, China, again, has a fairly commanding position in so far as the global supply chains are concerned. And this has uh, had a history behind it, because if you look at uh, the, the character of the pharmaceutical industry across the world, from the beginning of the 2000s and thereafter, uh, the biggest pharma manufacturers of the world, the pharma producers, you know, the Glenmarks and the Eli Lilies and all of them, decided to actually outsource and offshore the lower parts of their supply chains 
to more cost-effective and cost-efficient locations in, uh, in Asia. And that's where China has become a, a very important supplier of these with the ultimate uh, formulation and the research and development parts being left to the top firms uh, in the Western uh, economies. So in a sense, India has also been caught in this matrix and we are aware of India's uh, tremendous strength in genetic formulations. But the fact of the matter is that such genetic formulations and their supplies have a huge possibility of getting disrupted if supplies from China are not forthcoming. Similarly, if supplies from China, as far as telecom equipment is concerned, are not forthcoming, or solar panels are not forthcoming, then what that means is that there are economic disruptions to the outlook insofar as going ahead and capitalizing on uh, the support to the overall economic momentum of the country is concerned. Uh, let's say, for example, even when one looks at a fundamental industry like steel, iron and steel, you'd recall that this was a subject which was raised by uh, none other than uh, the United States president when the uh, Section 301 of the USTR Act was imposed on China that there was an identification of industries, which in the definition and understanding of that legislation amounted to industries which are, quote unquote, of national security interest. And iron and steel or aluminum features among those, as does big automobile, as does, uh, say, for example, the drugs and pharmaceuticals. So the fact of the matter is that China's overwhelming importance as a sourcing destination puts India into a kind of difficult situation in the event of supplies disruptions from China. And this was experienced firsthand during COVID-19. And that realization uh, has actually led India uh, to work in coalition with a large number of other countries who have similarly been affected by the understanding that uh, excessive concentration of sourcing needs to be avoided and sourcing needs to be diversified. So what we see as a result are the growth of what you alluded to in your opening remarks. Country coalitions, which find a country like India working with other countries to actually ensure a certain amount of balance, efficiency, and security in so far as the sourcing patterns are concerned. Uh, one of these uh, notable ones is the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, which has come up between India, Japan, and Australia. But the most important one is obviously the Quad. Uh, the Quad uh, group of countries have a history to them in so far as security understanding and discussions are concerned. But today, the Quad has also taken up a prominent economic role. And there is a, a clear cut agenda to the Quad's working in this regard. There are vaccine partnerships, there's supply resilience partnerships. But what we also see, Henrik, and this is where I think the regional order in so far as Asia and its linkages with the rest of the world and the uh, China-India story is concerned, takes a very different proportion, is that when one looks at articulation of concepts like the Indo-Pacific, today we find that the Indo-Pacific is no more an idea that is just left as a concept. Indo-Pacific has become an idea that is being implemented. And there is a framework which is going behind the Indo-Pacific and the Biden administration has proposed the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework with 14 countries, uh, which includes seven economies from Southeast Asia and includes India, Japan, Australia, Korea, the United States, a small Pacific country like the Fiji, but it does not include China. Now, when one goes further into the framework and takes a look at what this uh, framework is trying to address, what we see is that it is getting into the domain of trying to fix regional rules for doing business and setting standards on a large variety of subjects which have strong and long-term implications for flow of investments, capital, technology, people, and patented knowledge. Now, where does all this put the China-India relationship? Look, I think you began with the reflection that the China-India relationship has uh, really, over the last uh, two to three years that we noticed, I mean, this began from 2017 uh, in Galwan, which is uh, in, the, in the Bhutan domain of the China-India border. But then in 2020, uh, 
sorry, uh, I, I, I'm making a mistake here. The Galwan incident is the one that happened in 2020. Prior to that, in 2017, there was the Doklam incident, which happened in the Bhutan. Now, from Doklam to Galwan, if one travels that journey, one sees that the China-India hostilities have actually assumed a proportion, which wasn't seen in the previous five decades. You know, there, there, there were these uh, words being used earlier that, yes, there is hostility between China and India. There are tensions over the border. There's eyeball to eyeball contact between the armed forces on both sides, but not a single shot has been fired. Galwan changed this narrative completely with the loss of lives on both sides. And that led to a significant amount of reviewing of the relationship, particularly from the Indian side. And the reactions that followed from India subsequently went into the economic space and the economic domain. Now, India didn't really cut off economic relations with China, but India did in a substantive fashion without putting it out in words, went into actions which can amount to economic sanctions. Let's say, for example, in the tech space, you know, uh, denying Chinese companies access to the 5G auctions in India, uh, banning a large number of Chinese software and their uh, applications in India. Now, all these were uh, efforts by India to ensure that China or Chinese producers do not get the access into a space in India, which can be critical in so far as national security interests are concerned. But on the other hand, this is the interesting part. On the other hand, if you look at the trajectory of trade that has followed, the trajectory of trade continues to retain China as India's biggest source of imports. And the trade numbers remain robust, driven by imports. So what does that mean? That essentially means that in so far as India's position uh, on the trade side is concerned, there's a certain degree of reliance that India continues to have on China. There are initiatives that India has proposed in this regard, production-linked initiatives for building local self-reliance. But those initiatives take time to materialize as much as uh, it takes time to get fructified into the country alliances that India is working on. So in the foreseeable future, Henrik, if I uh, could conclude my initial intervention on this slide, in the foreseeable future, there is uh, probably this expectation that the India-China trade relationship will continue to exhibit uh, by and large, the characteristic that it has explained or exhibited till now, I mean, there are possibilities of Indian products getting greater access into the Chinese market, so there would be some reflections on it from the export side, but it is not immediately that India is going to get rid of its dependence on China as a source of import. So to that extent, the trade decoupling is not going to happen immediately, but on the other hand, there are other frontiers other strategic frontiers where India is already cautious and has taken these initiatives with other countries to ensure that it does not run into the kind of dependence that it has with China on an unavoidable trade side. So I'll stop there for the time being and I'm happy to take any further questions that you want. Thank you so much, Amitandra. I'm sure we will get back to you uh, in the question and answer session and also uh, when we are sort of concluding the entire panel. But I think one of the things that you brought up was, of course, the, the emergence of the Indo-Pacific as a you know, strategic domain and, uh, uh, and the question about the maritime domain and secure uh, sea links and so forth. And I think that is a good way of, of, of moving over to you, Per, um, because uh, you're an expert on defense uh, economy and defense spending, and you have noticed a slight change in India's approach to how it um, um, allocates uh, funds and so forth, which is sort of related to new geoeconomic, um, uh, a new geoeconomic reality and, and challenges that India is facing. So uh, please, Pat. Thank you, Anakin. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I would first like to back up. I will address the question, backing up a bit, and then just painting a broad picture of the, the economic, the geoeconomic and military rivalry between China and India. And I'm do, going to do some comparisons here. And that's always, you know, uh, a bit tricky because then you, you 
when you do that, you automatically pitch nations against each other. But that's, as we were talking about, there's also a large cooperation. There are two independent, interdependent economies here with a huge bilateral trade, as mentioned by Amitendo. And uh, uh, they, according to the European Parliament, the report has 70% of world trade flows through the Indo-Pacific region and 60% of FDI. That seems a bit high to me, but again, it's European uh, Parliament sources and um, you know, it, it could be true. I don't know if they count PPP, but still, it's a, in any case, it's a significant chunk of world trade that goes through these waters. Um, and there's two narrow straits here. We have the Strait of Malacca and the, the um, Strait of Hormuz, and also uh, further north, the, the um, um, of course, the Suez Canal. So. Uh, there are some show points, strategic show points, and uh, um, in these very uh, strategically important waters of world trade, we have everything from electronics, semiconductors, rare earth, minerals, and uh, petroleum flowing through uh, these waters. Uh, vital for not just the economies in the Indo Pacific, but for world economy function. Uh, and uh, um, in this situation when we're comparing India and China, there's a huge disparity in strength between the two economies, but I will also touch upon that that doesn't necessarily translate into capabilities or, or power projection. Uh, China is the second world, uh, world's second largest economy, 17.7 billion uh, in, in uh, 2021 uh, US dollars. It's about 18.5% of the global GDP compared to India. It's, 3.2 billion dollars and 3.3 percent of GDP, world GDP, so it's a one fifth. But uh, again, that's counting in, in um, market exchange rates and not purchasing power values. Then, then that would be a bit more equal. But still, there's a huge discrepancy between the two. Uh, uh, and we've seen in later years that India has begun to grow at a faster rate, though. In China, I think that's quite kind of natural. They're in a different stage um, of their growth uh, story. Uh, the beginning, this transition into a demographic dividend now, and we should expect high growth rates. Uh, on the other hand, the demographic dividend also means that you have to find meaningful employment to your um, uh, or to your young population entering the work space. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. But I think for India, it's more of a question, can they achieve, not only can they achieve high growth figures for a quarter or a, a fiscal year, but can they actually do it over time? And that's really what makes the difference. Um, and GDP, of course, is the prerequisite for building. Um, that, that's uh, what you have to build your military expenditure on. I think it's very clear when you look at China, they haven't really sort of changed the share they devote to defense or military expenditure in the last two decades, but uh, or rather military expenditure just follow GDP. Uh, um, and currently it stands, China's military expenditure is about 290 billion US dollar, uh, 14 or so percent of global military spending. Um, still only a fraction of what the US, about a third, I think, of what the US spends. Uh, but it has rapidly caught up, or oh, oh, it's rapidly sort of decreased the gap. We have a, a more than a hundred percent increase in the last decade. Or so uh, India spends seventy six point six billion uh, US dollars on defense, uh, and that's about a fourth of what China spends. Uh, as and that means that India has a sort of higher share. Uh, or quota uh, a fourth compared to a fifth of GDP, and that's because India spends a larger share of GDP on defense. Um, increased about a third uh, or so in the last decade. So, with, and this naturally translates into a huge discrepancy when it comes to pure numbers. Uh, China has more men in their military, it's like 2 million, 5,000, almost 6,000 tanks, several thousands armored vehicles, artillery systems. Uh, China has two aircraft carriers, point plus one now that they've launched. It's not yet in service, won't be for a couple of years. Um, several hundred surface combatants, um, 
or at least it was about 150, if you could count destroyers, frigates, and corvettes, and several submarines and uh, over 1,600 combat aircraft. And so I'm just number bombing you right now, but bear with me. Uh, in India has about 1.5 billion million or so um, uh, people in their armed forces, um, about 3,700 tanks. So it's a, uh, almost half a lot less armored vehicles. So it's a less mechanized force we're looking at, but it has, it's not that far a discrepancy when it comes to, to uh, personnel. And that has impl implications then when we talk about priorities and, and uh, what you invest in. But we've seen a steady growth in, in uh, the Navy. Uh, India just commissioned its second, uh, now in the 2nd of September, the second uh, aircraft carrier, Vikrant, uh, joining the Vikramaditya. Uh, and uh, we the, about 10 destroyers, 12 frigates, and, and 11 corvettes. So, so it's uh, all in all about 45 or so surface combatants and several submarines, about um, 50, 15 uh, conventional submarines and one strategic nuclear submarine, and about close to 600 combat aircraft. So, as I said, in terms of just pure numbers, there's a discrepancy between the two nations. But on the other hand, that's not how you fight uh, a war. You don't throw your entire forces at each other. It, it's it's all about geography and and uh, um, strategic location. And we see now with the Ukraine that just because you have a stronger force doesn't necessarily mean that you will achieve victory in any sense. <clears throat> Second of all, I mean the, the spaces of confrontation between these two nations. I just I mean as we talked about the Ladakh confrontations, uh, just people fighting, not even with weapons, just with, you know, brutally fighting with maces and clubs. So, and it's a terrain that's not really um, uh, sort of uh, very tolerant to tanks and, and heavy equipment. Um, so, I mean, geography plays a huge uh, amount of role here because uh, as I said, I mean, even if China has a overwhelming number of um, combat aircraft in this space, India has several more airfields uh, around this area. So again, they say, even if India fears Chinese incursions into the Indian Ocean, I was concerned about that. I mean, uh, it, it's just China doesn't really have the logistics to project power into what essentially is India's home waters. Um, but of course, I mean, it, it doesn't mean that uh, concerns are completely unfounded. I mean, China has close relations with Pakistan and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. So, um, and they they are in the Indian Ocean to protect their interests when it comes to the whole Moose Strait because India cuts the Indian Ocean like like a uh, uh, wedge right down the middle and of course these are strategic waters for China as well when it comes to petroleum products etc. Um, so and. Um, yeah, that's, I think I'll stop there You're saying that, well, there's a huge discrepancy in strength, uh, but that doesn't necessarily, uh, isn't all that matters. I think that, um, so I can just mention also that there is some, uh, just looking into the future, um, I think that for India to catch up or, or to modernize more quickly, the Priority on personnel has to go down, but I, I also acknowledge that that's extremely difficult. I mean, uh, China modernized by reducing the amount of people they have to, to mechanize and to, to invest in very expensive stuff like aircraft and, and ships. Uh, but again, it's very tricky because you can do that perhaps in China where you have, you know, Communist Party rules the army. Uh, it's a bit tricky to do it in a democracy where you have a lot of um, I mean, having a lot of disgruntled people that you fire, uh, it's, it's uh, and, and also you have a large territory with a lot, a lot of perhaps of internal tensions that you want to um, uh, sort of keep a check on. So it's not an easy thing to do, uh, is my, uh, my point. And uh, it, it does become easier with growth and we have seen impressive growth rates from India in the last uh, decade or so. so yeah, we'll see, but it's a, it's still um, sort of a, a journey to be made here. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Parry. Uh, just to follow up on something um, that, that you sort of alluded to um, and uh, that Amitando also brought up, it's the question of uh, burden sharing and uh, flexible groupings and coalitions, not uh, uh, treaty alliances, but um, uh, I'm talking about the Indo-Pacific space here. So uh, we have seen India um, working together with partners uh, in the maritime domain in ways that it per perhaps didn't uh, some years back. Is there something that you, I mean, uh, would like to comment on a bit, these kinds of um, uh, flexible groupings and, um, uh, and um, uh, um, ways of, of dealing with um, uh, perhaps um, resource deficiencies and, and other aspects? Mm. Okay, so th this is an interesting question. I, it's a good thing you asked it, or otherwise I would have missed it. Uh, so I think from China's point of view, uh, the concern with India is not so much India in itself, mainly India being part of a wider coalition, sort of like a quad, and, and uh, increasing cooperation with Japan, Australia, and in particular the US. The US is the sort of the, the, the main concern of China, of course. Um, but having China or having India in such a coalition, that, that sort of what the, 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 the closer relationship between India and the West is what concerns them. Uh, and um, I mean, India does a joint, lot of joint exercises uh, and have stepped up cooperation, Malabar exercises, for instance. Um, uh, they do it multilaterally. I mean, as you well know, India has a long tradition of remaining, having a neutral policy. I think from the West is always a question, you know, why isn't India firmly in the Western camp, you know, with the rivalry with China and so on. Um, but I think that the, the reverse question would be, well, the West hasn't always been firmly in the Indian camp. So that sort of explains uh, a lot of that, but I think that we, we see a shift in policy priorities and when you see uh, that India is tying closer and closer to um, to the West, uh, mainly driven by the rivalry with China uh, and uh, sort of slowly distancing itself uh, from, from its reliance on Russia. I think both has to do with uh, the war in Ukraine, but it, we saw it even previously, you know, with the, the purchase of Rafale French aircraft and French submarines, so to speak. So, yeah, I wouldn't say it's a complete shift, but because these things take time, but there's a slow movement. Thank you very much. Um, uh, before, uh, I just need to uh, just repeat uh, uh, for the record that you please submit your questions in the Q&A function and we'll try to pick them one by one. Um, but um, um, I would like to turn to you, uh, Maloncho, uh, because there is a, an aspect of this that is not often discussed, um, and that is um, the ways in which India uh, now and China earlier ties um, development cooperation, um, uh, lines of credit and so forth closer to their overall um, foreign policy um, priorities. And uh, when it comes to India, we can see that they have um, um, changed their ways of approaching uh, development cooperation over the last years, especially since 2003, uh, but also in its outreach to build partnerships with uh, smaller states in Africa and Indian Ocean region. And this sort of ties in a little bit to the new sort of geoeconomic um, uh, um, situation that India is facing and partly related to China as well. So uh, please, uh, Malonchu. Thank you, Henrik. Uh, I think I'd start with uh, the way you framed your uh, question uh, that um, India's development cooperation has really a very long history. But as you've just mentioned from the early 2000s, there was a dramatic shift. And the shift was not only in terms of the scale in which India's development cooperation grew, but also there was some changes in the approach. So historically, uh, 
despite being a relatively poor country, relative, uh, being very uh, uh, being a net receiver of aid itself, India uh, took on the leadership of the third world countries. There was a large anti-colonial sentiment in the 50s and the 60s, and uh, India's development cooperation literally dates back to 19. 49 when uh, the scholarship started. Subsequently, we know the most celebrated uh, initiative was the ITEC. But from 2003, we see that, you know, on the back of very high growth rates that were experienced post 1990s in the liberalization period, India was able to expand its development cooperation to a level which the world hadn't seen before. And um, uh, the ambition level of the country also changed, you know, I mean, it, uh, the global aspirations were different. The uh, idea was to be able to influence global norms. So from early 2000s, we see that, uh, you know, there were significant changes where India said that it does not want to receive aid anymore. In first in 2003, then in 2007, there was a very clear uh, 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 shift. So uh, the India Development Initiative was launched in 2003, which is when the first lines of credit were launched. So uh, this was a remarkable shift, uh, not only in terms of the amount of uh, money that India was willing to commit to development cooperation, the um, ambition of the projects, the kind of development projects India was willing to and able to execute in other countries, particularly in the neighborhood and in African countries, but also in terms of some of somewhat of a dilution of things like the third world solidarity and South-South cooperation, which didn't seem to be very uh, relevant in that kind of a world. And uh, there was uh, uh, the respect towards sovereignty of the other countries and the idea of something that India calls demand-driven development. So, uh, as a friendly gesture, whatever the host country would sort of identify a project, India would try and implement that project through its lines of credit program. And the lines of credit program has grown uh, tremendously. And uh, uh, we've seen big announcements being made at the India-Africa Summit. And some of the uh, neighboring countries uh, have been uh, uh, the biggest uh, uh, beneficiaries uh, of this program. And uh, this note did, of course, uh, 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 was noted as one of the most important developments at the international development scene. And interestingly, China was also, uh, you know, uh, doing something similar in uh, the early 2000s. So they also started with their going out program and Chinese companies were encouraged to go and invest abroad. And there was tremendous state support to do that. With something very similar, uh, the Chinese state uh, and the Chinese, uh, Ch uh, some of the Chinese, China Exim Bank, China Development Bank were giving huge resources, mainly to African countries, but also to many other countries uh, in the region. Uh, to largely support infrastructure. So back in those days, you know, the narrative was very different as uh, uh, Amitendu has already observed that, you know, uh, uh, relations have particularly soured in recent times, particularly since Doklam and now after Galvan. But um, uh, mid 2000s, uh, there was a very different narrative. It was like the emerging countries, they are experiencing very high growth rates. They are challenging uh, some of the older players. They are challenging the Development Assistance Committee donors, which have traditionally played the most important role at the international development scene. The norms are very different because the norms of mutual benefit and uh, the norms of demand-driven development were very different from the prescriptive approach which the West had always been accused of. So in, in most Western uh, discourse, there was uh, 
a bracketing of China and uh, India together. So it was like China, I mean, I, I would read a lot of those uh, articles which said China and India are together scrambling for African resources, this new colonialism, which was being led by these two emerging giants from Asia. So the narrative was very different. And uh, some of these similarities in terms of uh, both China and India not being a part of uh, the DSC, uh, not really uh, following uh, the standard OECD norms, made uh, some sense why perhaps uh, uh, there was some uh, degree of correctness in putting the two of them together. But now we have nearly two decades of uh, experience of both China's development assistance and India's development assistance, which has grown, but it hasn't really grown uh, to the level that China's uh, development cooperation has grown. It's a huge country and uh, the amount of resources it has been able to put and not always in the right places because uh, many of these projects have turned out to be white elephants. And uh, now uh, many of the developing countries are also realizing that it's not, uh, uh, I mean, it's easy money, but it's not really easy money because uh, some countries like Sri Lanka, uh, uh, in case of the Hambantota Airport, have had very bad experiences. So uh, Chinese lending practices are being increasingly questioned, uh, not only because uh, some countries like Sri Lanka find themselves losing their strategic um, uh, autonomy, but also uh, many of the countries are finding themselves in severe debt strain. So they've taken on so many loans to create so many infrastructure projects, and now many of these projects are not as economically viable as they initially felt. So much of Africa is like that. Even the uh, even Bangladeshi minister uh, said something uh, that, you know, we don't want any more Chinese loans. So uh, the economic side of it is uh, uh, is also being felt that, you know, here is a country which is sort of trying to uh, give too much loans and trapping other countries. But now the narrative has changed because India-China uh, rivalry is, uh, is almost at its height. And uh, uh, now we are increasingly hearing and reading about uh, how development cooperation can be used or is being used to counter each other. Now, I mean, my take would be that I wouldn't totally agree that uh, countering China is the objective of India's development cooperation because it's not. Uh, so we have a certain history and uh, many of the things are a continuation of that history. So, uh, I mean, the goodwill that uh, India enjoys in Africa, there is a, a, there's a very old legacy. Now, back in the day when uh, India was not a relatively uh, developed country, uh, it was didn't have the resources, it was more known for many of these smaller projects of uh, capacity building projects. So something like the Pan-Africa e-network would not have been possible uh, before the 2000s when India started growing at a very rapid rate. So much of it, we don't find very strong evidence of um, uh, China being one of the major reasons why India is growing its footprint in, in Africa. Uh, however, I would say that uh, China is a very important uh, element in India's foreign policy. So, uh, the objectives of development cooperation, India's development cooperation program, particularly the lines of credit program is very clear. A, there is an economic reason, you know, we want to help our uh, companies go and uh, uh, conquer new markets, be able to uh, establish themselves in, in hitherto unexplored uh, regions, for instance, large parts of Africa. Uh, then uh, we want to internationalize Indian companies. 75% uh, of the inputs come from India. So there is a very clear uh, economic uh, uh, reason why India wants uh, to grow its development cooperation budget. But also uh, there is significant goodwill and you want to 
make relationships with other countries where, which are important from the point of view of energy security or even uh, many other objectives. But yes, China does seem to be uh, important uh, in the neighborhood, in the Indo-Pacific, in the context of Sri Lanka, in the context of many of these other countries, because it seems uh, that some of the... Um, so in the future, because uh, we are discussing uh, also future, we might see uh, newer forms of cooperation, development cooperation, which uh, uh, with other countries, uh, some of the traditional donors, for instance, the Asia-Africa corridor did sort of seem to be uh, as a, uh, as a counter to the VRI. But then again, you know, nothing much happened on that front. So it was not really, a, uh, it was announced as a, a very big thing, but then the implementation has been uh, rather slow. Uh, we might see more collaborations with um, countries like the UK, for instance, or, uh, uh, or uh, some of these uh, other countries like US in the Indo-Pacific because, um, I mean, as uh, Amit Hindu and Per explained very well, that this is the region which is more contested. So in this region, we might see some of the development cooperation projects, large infrastructure projects, which, uh, which have a much more strategic, uh, 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 I mean, India looking at development cooperation through a much more strategic lens than it has uh, done before. But overall, I, I would say that India's development cooperation has many other objectives, and China could be uh, one of the concerns in um, particularly in this region, but it may increasingly start to dominate uh, depending on uh, how how well the two countries are able to negotiate their uh, security relations. So I will quickly end here, and I would be uh, happy to take on uh, more questions. Thank you very much, Malunchu. Um, I think I'll come back with a few questions to you as well. But first, let me just ask uh, direct a question to you, Amitando, from, from the audience here. Um, so the question is, do you see India re reaching a position where they can seriously challenge China as the main production hub of the world? Thank you uh, so much for that uh, question, Hendrik. I think uh, we need to understand what we actually mean when we allude to the term production hub. Uh, there was a time I remember maybe uh, not too far back in the distant past, maybe even 10, nine years ago, when one could safely conclude that uh, almost 80% of what uh, the world uses, from the time it gets up in the morning till the time it goes to bed at night, was made in China. Now, from that situation, further discoveries have happened, which actually show that a made in China level does not necessarily mean that all of that product was made in China. And particularly when one looks at, you know, what the world is using, let's say the iPhones, for example, uh, the bulk of iPhones that are used by people in the world are labeled at the back made in China, but that's just because they are assembled in China. A considerable part of the value addition in that iPhone actually happens from outside China. So in that sense, I think the idea of China being a production hub actually needs to be revisited in some context. When I particularly see the China of today, I think the point uh, that I'd like to make in this regard is that uh, we continue looking at China as a production spot, but China has become increasingly important as a consumption market. And as a result of that, I think when one looks at India also, the important point to note is that there are shifts that will happen. India clearly, I don't think, has an objective of replacing China in so far as uh, vacating the space created by China is concerned because the comparative advantages of the two countries are different. The resource endowments are different. The skill levels and the efficiency patterns are different. 
But I think bigger question that uh, both India and China will be preoccupied with is that when it comes to a handful of industries that are going to be called these strategic and cutting edge industries that will give both countries the opportunity to compete for strategic influence out of the economic dominance in these industries, whether there, there is the possibility of India being in that race with China, you know, in a capable and competent fashion. I think the strategy that India has picked up in this regard is that it has clearly decided it's going to work with others. And uh, well, that, that I think is the uh, realistic and pragmatic way forward. Thank you, Amitando. And and I also want to um, um, ask you, and anyone else in the panel can chip in as well, um, because one area that we haven't touched upon is the rapid growth in the digital domain, both in China and and um, in India, of course. And we have seen, as you mentioned, Amitando, we have also seen a sort of um, some sort of sec securitization of that domain and the ban of Chinese apps, for example, in India and yeah. so forth. So I wonder if you could perhaps comment a little bit on that and everyone, anyone else in the panel, just feel free to chip in if you have any more um, reflections on that. And also um, um, for, the, for the audience, please, uh, there are a few minutes left so you can uh, still submit some questions into the chat box, uh, sorry, to the Q&A function. Henrik, thank you for bringing this up. I think uh, being based where you are in Stockholm, you would be aware of the advances that Sweden has been making in the area of digital currency, for example. Now, when we look at uh, the advances that are happening in the world of digital functions, I mean, it's not just a result of COVID. It is not a result of any systemic change that is happening in the way the world is engaging with each other, but it's just that technology is uh, making progress. And because of that, a large number of functions are being rendered obsolete and are being replaced by more digital versions. When we talk about the use of digital technology, we are probably uh, broadly alluding to wherever the artificial intelligence is being applied in a, a tall domain, let's say in ed tech, fintech, agricultural tech, and so on and so forth. Now, obviously China being the kind of commanding economy that is, uh, does have strength in a large number of these areas. India in its own selective way has developed the expertise in a large number of areas. But I think the important uh, deficiency that needs to be noted in so far as both China and India are concerned is that they are yet in their own respects, unable to address the question of scientific regulations which will bring all these digital connections together in an enabling fashion and enable them to engage effectively with the rest of the world. Uh, to give you an example, let's say when one looks at China, when one looks at the growth of digital retail uh, patterns within China, it's a phenomenal growth, but whether that growth can actually lend itself to a similar pattern of exchange between China and the rest of the world is something which is not yet clear. And perhaps that is where the Chinese efforts to roll out the digital yuan and make it interoperable with other digital sovereign currencies that are being tried out in many other countries might make a difference. India so far in this respect has uh, played a role which is selective to its area of advantage, but I think in India as well, the challenge of bringing in effective regulations is turning out to be a very substantial challenge, particularly when one looks at uh, cross-border data transfers, data localization, privacy issues, the question of digital signatures, authentication of digital identities. I think these are where uh, the system is grappling in India to produce the effective solutions, because in India, there are systemic gaps that exist across certain capacities of its institutions. It's, it's going to be a fairly tall order to climb. Uh, I don't want to compare India and China head to head in this regard, but I think both countries really have a long distance to cover in this respect. Thank you very much uh, for those reflections. I, uh, we have um, another question here from the audience. Um, I'm, I'll read it out and I, I, I think I'll direct it to Per. Um, this newly found rapprochement between India and China, again in the economic field, manifests a zero-sum situation in international relations. Is China playing games 
with its close relations with the West, hence even refused to categorically condemn Russia, a friend of China, in its war on Ukraine. So, Per, uh, do you have any reflections on that? I think that <clears throat> both India and China has had some problems condemning Russia all the way out. Uh, for China, that's not very surprising. They they are firmly sort of supporting, have been uh, supporting Putin in this. They have a more sort of um, uh, value based. Uh, they're, they're closer to each other. I mean, both are authoritarian countries, um, and. Uh, it's it's a matter for them both to stand united against the West, even though it makes China a bit uncomfortable. I don't think they would ever suspect that it has gone this bad for Russia uh, as it has. Um, and I don't know uh, what went on behind closed doors, but I believe that I don't know if the Chinese even were informed. But I don't think they ever suspected that it was going to go like this. Uh, um, it doesn't look good for their side. Um, and I think that for India as well, it has been, um, I mean, both Xi Jinping and, and it seems like Xi Jinping because Putin commented that China was concerned and Modi, um, Narendra Modi straight out told Putin that they were concerned about this. So criticism has been ramping up from these two countries. But uh, again, it's it, these are difficult ties to, uh, I don't think none of them wants to sever ties, but um, even to sort of uh, scale back a bit is tricky for these countries. They're, they're very dependent on, on Russian technology when it comes to the defense industry um, and have long-standing relationships with Russia. Uh, but I think that um, when it comes to uh, so if China balancing, of course, yeah, China's balancing the relationship towards the West. They haven't breached sanctions though. That's important to note. Um, they don't really, want, the Western market is far, far, far more important uh, for China than, um, than is ever Russia going to be. Um, and I think that for India, it's going to be a slight rebalancing as well in time. Um, I think that they, they are seeing, well, I'm talking here now <laughs> from Swedish perspective, of course, but I tend to see that there's a revaluation of sort of a more uh, um, closeness to the West than to Russia. Just to follow up on that, uh, the, these recent um, 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 uh, the communication we saw from from Samarkand and uh, the recent meeting, um, is there anything to make out of those uh, sort of comments that were made, uh, both by Modi and, uh, but also uh, Putin addressing China's concerns or or mentioning them? You think, Per? Um, no. Well, I, um, as I said, I think that the, the fact that they voice their concerns is noteworthy. Um, and that alludes to somewhat of a shift in, in rhetoric that I think that the Russians are going, are beginning to feel the pressure now. And, and uh, not just, I mean, from those two countries, but also in real life, that they're, they're being pressured back by the Ukrainians now. But so the, 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 and you see that there's going to be a lot of things coming up now with, with uh, uh, human rights violations and, and you know, when, when, the, uh, when the Ukrainians are pushing them back. So, uh, it, yeah, the, 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 um, the pressure is also on, on both India and China as well, the distance themselves. I think that's going to keep, uh, keep happening in, a, in the coming months or so. Thank you. Uh, and uh, with that, I would like to thank all our panelists for a wonderful session. Um, uh, it's been really a privilege to, to host you and also to the audience for submitting questions and for attending. Uh, this is, of course, a, uh, an issue that will stay with us for a, a very long time. And it, um, it's very sort of interesting for us to follow up on it. So stay tuned. Um, there will for sure be more occasions to discuss India-China relations in its different facets. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you all uh, for today and hope to see you soon again. Thank you. Thank you, Henrik. Thank you so much.